Journey to Forbes BLK Summit here in Atlanta, man. Thank you for joining me. Isaac Hayes III. Thank you for coming to Fanbase, man. Appreciate it. Right here in Atlanta. So, I mean, listen, this is a, a dope setup. I mean, this is a fabulous, when I walked in the door, I see the neon colors and I'm like, this is amazing. I yeah. Mean, when you looked and you was designing the studio, what did you have in mind? What were you aiming for? I wanted something that people felt like they could film and use to be creative. I wanted different sections and different spaces of the office to be creative. So we have a podcast studio, we have this little section over here to be conversational film, we have this stage where we do musical performances. So I wanted something that content creation could always be part of the office, so the office was also a set at the same time. Yeah. What is Fanbase? Fanbase is a social media platform. Um, that allows any user to monetize their content via subscription if they so choose. So uh, you can have followers and subscribers on the exact same page. So it just adds an added layer of monetization for every single person that uses the platform. Yeah. When you say monetization, people want to hear that money. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it means money for, for those content Absolutely. creators. And everybody's a content creator in, in today's society. Yeah. How can they monetize? So they can monetize via subscription or digital currency. Mm -hmm. So um, my belief is that the future of television is not going to be networks, it's going to be individuals. So I, I use, a, I use a, an example of broadcast media. So we've widely known broadcast media all our lives. Broadcast media are large cable networks, Xfinity, Comcast, so on and so forth. The last 10 or 15 years, we've moved into what I call the narrow cast era, which are streaming networks, Netflix, Disney+, Plus, Hulu, all that type of stuff, right? I think the next level down from that is called microcasting or micro subscriptions, where I subscribe directly to you or an artist or a brand for the content that they create specifically. So through fan base, it turns everybody into their own version of a network um, that they can monetize. Media is tough for, for startups, period. And black startups don't get, I don't wind up on TechCrunch. I don't get, you know, I don't get those calls to appear on those platforms and far inferior or less successful platforms get so much more press than we do. But even having the opportunity to have this type of platform is incredible and amazing for us. You said 200,000 before, that was a lot of money. Listen, black companies usually don't start with that amount of money, yeah. right? You usually have, according to you know studies, they start about 35,000 the average, you know, mm -hmm. 35,000 compared to Mm -hmm. uh, white uh, entrepreneurs who start off about 100,000. You say 200,000 of, yeah. of your own money. So that's a great entry point. That's flashback, right? I mean, you, you said it off the top. You are where you are, Isaac Hayes the third, right? Yeah. People who don't know your dad was a musical icon and yeah. Isaac Hayes. And you grew up in Atlanta. Yeah, man, that, pff, Atlanta, Atlanta is, is the reason why fan base exists, part, part of the big reason. I think there's an energy here that you can achieve anything. Mm -hmm. One of the first things that, one of the first conversations that I had, I had one conversation with a VC before I ever did equity crowdfunding. And the question they asked me is, why would you want to go up against Facebook and Instagram? Like they said it like, are you crazy? Like, what? they're giants. Like, and I was like, well, for one, knowing the development team that I have in place that they can build, we can build anything. I was like, I can build everything that Facebook can build. Facebook and Instagram can't build me. I know that the core and the energy of social media is kids and black culture. So without that, it doesn't matter. So you can't build black culture. So you're, I don't care what your buttons do, I don't care what functionality you have, if you don't have cool dances, cool songs, cool phrases, cool phrases, cool phraseology, slang, it doesn't work. Great fashion, humor, your platforms are very, very boring. And so that's why I know that we're taking culture and infrastructure and merging it into one. Because right now, there's this predatory relationship between the bigger platforms like TikTok, like Facebook, like Instagram, and then the culture creators that make billions and billions of dollars for these companies, but they don't have any equity. They don't, they don't get paid at all if they do. And so I'm saying, oh, the tech, and the, infra, the tech and the culture are under one roof. And also we're giving any person, any age, any race to actually invest in own part of the company. I had yeah. to study the landscape to understand how it functions because once you study the landscape, that's, a, that's an enormous economic opportunity because now you have the ability for people, the average everyday person to have equity in a platform they use. And here's the, here's the, here's the flip behind that. The, the value of startups or social media platforms primarily comes from the user base. The more users you have, the more valuable your company is, right? So let's say somebody built a social media platform and allow the users to actually have a part of the company and then those users move to that platform and by simply using the platform and moving over, they're increasing the value of an asset that they own. Yeah. 
Crazy idea, huh? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Why I did it? Because it's like, yo, that's, that's crazy because it's like, you know, we've gone from, we've gone from 10,000 users when I was started raising capital to over 430,000 users now. Wow. It's been a slow grind. We don't have the capital, even of the nine, $10 million that we've raised over the last three years. Um, there's startups that have come and gone that are inferior to our platform that have raised $35 million and spent the money in 18 months. And I'm like, but they're not, they don't, they're not my color. They didn't get 30, and, and, it came, and the money came from venture capital. So it's like, oh, so a VC will give you $35 million to blow in 18 months. And look at me like, well, what, what have you done? What's your traction and whatever and things like that. So I, under, I understand what I'm dealing with. So independent was the way to go. Yeah. Well, that's where you are now, right? Yeah. But you weren't always that way. Again, we flashing back, right? Yeah. Take me back to that young Isaac Hayes III. Maybe the one <laughs> Saturday, getting up in the morning, going to watch cartoons, <laughs> eating a bowl of cereal, right? Yeah. Did you know that you wanted to maybe follow your dad's footsteps and get into music? There were two things that I wanted to do uh, that I always thought about as a career was designing or creating video games, something to do with technology or production and music. And ironically, I wind up doing both. Mm. I have two chapters. My first chapter was a songwriter, producer. I started um, songwriting, producing right out of high school. Um, I learned about music publishing, something that is extremely important. It's musical real estate. For anybody that doesn't know what music publishing is, it's just the ownership of, of songs, whether it's the lyrics or the melody. Um, and I was able to create a catalog that I licensed um, to, to TV and film networks that they play in the background and I make money. So I'm making money while I'm, I'm sleeping. I'm not fighting to get on this person's album because that gets political, you know? It's like, you know, super big artist has an album coming out, there's only 12 songs on the album, there's probably 20,000 producers and songwriters that want to get on that album, so it's a game of musical chairs. And in that, there's also other agendas. Well, maybe the, maybe the artist has producers signed to them. Maybe they have that, so they already got three songs. You know, and then, and then they've had success with other producers, so they're making sure they get those people on there, and then they got friends that they want to get on there, and then here I am, outside of four or five doors trying to get my song on that same album. It doesn't mean that I didn't try. It's just a lot harder to do. Yeah. So you go through and you're interested in music and yeah. interested in building video games and it sounds like you went the musical path yeah. much more as a producer. Yeah. When did you start to pivot to and, and start to maybe think about family? Uh, I, so I started managing my father's estate in 2013. Mm -hmm. He passed in 2008. And so I wasn't, I leaned into that position wholeheartedly because I understood how important it was to actually get his business together because there was a lot of terrible things that happened with him with regard to music publishing. Um, and so I had to work on getting masters back, publishing back, and I spent a decade of really reclaiming a lot of the rights that he lost as a songwriter over his career. Um, so we were able to do that. Um, we have over 400 masters that are unreleased that are Isaac Hayes instrumentals. That when it's coming out? I can't tell you. <laughs> I can't tell you when, but um, uh, we have about 400 or so that are unreleased instrumentals, songs, and stuff like that. And so, producers love we, that sound. Yeah, oh yeah. Oh, trust me, no people. You know, they're, they're, and so they're, it's cool things that I'm able to do now. Um, I just did something really cool with Snoop Dogg. I can't tell you about, but uh, I, I can I can drop this as a hint. Um, there was a sample of Isaac Hayes on Snoop Dogg's original album, Doggy Style. Mm. For some reason, that song had to get taken off the album. Well, listen, your dad was too, right? Yeah. Great, a great musical talent, great yeah. actor. We, yep. When I first met you, I told you what I listened to, yeah. right? Chuck Turner, yeah. that soundtrack. So what's the biggest thing you've learned maybe from your dad? Ownership, mm. the business side. I always, I look at intelligence as compartmental. I think that it is totally possible for someone to be brilliant in one area and uneducated in another. And typically in the music industry, that happens. That happens a lot. They're talented people that take the stage, write these amazing songs, but the business side is something that they get taken advantage of through publishing or bad contracts. We've seen it happen to Prince. We've seen it happen to Michael Jackson. We've seen it happen to an enormous amount of artists. And so I've always wanted to learn the business side of music so I understood, okay, ownership. And I think through that, it limited my, my path in growing because you couldn't get anything past me. It's like, oh, okay, well, who owns the publishing and how much of the song and X, Y, Z? So it gets a lot of, it gets very political in the music business. So what I, what I liked about TV and film and what I learned from my dad is that um, that side of the business is very cut and dry. Television and film is, you know, there's unions. Mm -hmm. it's fees is what's due at the time. It's not political. You do some music, you write it, you get paid for it. And here you are now, right, running yeah. your own business yep. as CEO and founder. What's it like to be a CEO of a social media app? Um, it's pretty cool. It's very interesting. I think you get to look at the world through the lens of psychology and technology at the same time. Because social media is, in my opinion, 50% psychology 
and 50% technology. There are things that, em that emotions that drive people to use social media in, a, in, in an, uh, a multitude of ways, right? One of them, or a few of them, I say there's four. I say there's four pillars of engagement to social media that I say. I say it's um, attention, information, uh, entertainment, and conflict. And that's the core of social media, is those four pillars. If you can control and generate engagement through those four verticals, you will have the most amazing platform ever. As a matter of fact, all great television shows, all great um, um, television programs that are live on television have that, right? If I were to talk about The View, right? The View has all four. The View has, okay, attention. So-and-so's here to plug their movie, right? Okay, cool. Information, we'll be back with the best back-to-school shopping savings for the fall, right? Um, entertainment, so-and-so's here to perform their new single off their new album. Then conflict, the hosts go at each other the first part of the show. It's that, it's, though, it's that element that creates that energy. And I think conflict is at the foundation of all social media. That's why platforms like Twitter work. That's why social media people go back and forth in the comments, Facebook, is because our identity is rooted in what we believe. Take me on a day in the life mm -hmm. of Isaac Hayes III as CEO, founder of Family. So I'm talking when you get up in the morning, right? Mm -hmm. The first social media app you open is your own, right? You yeah. Say, After that, yeah. what's the day in the life? Uh, I get up, I check Slack. Right, that's, uh, that's, we communicate internally or whatever, so I always check to see what meetings I have for the day, what things are going on, what product releases, what meetings, all that kind of stuff that happens because there's always something going on. And as the CEO of a company, I have to take part in multiple meetings. I have to be part of the development meeting. I have to be part of the refining meeting. I have to be part of the marketing calls. I have to be uh, part of the financial calls. So all these things are going on all day, every day, but then simultaneously, I'm out raising capital. I'm also representing or talking to other people about joining the platform. So it's a lot that I, a lot that I have to do, but uh, I credit the team that we have at Fanbase that actually really make the platform um, a phenomenal platform and a great company because they're the ones that really make everything work. It's like seamlessly working together. Team is so important in building the company. So uh, my day is, is filled with fun. I, the only thing I, I love the most is I get to wear tennis shoes and jeans every day, right? Um, <laughs> you don't want to wear a suit? <laughs> nah, I mean, I, 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 like, I, it's cool, I get it, but I've always just been a, a, a t-shirt and jeans kind of guy. I, I literally wear the same thing every day yeah. and it makes it simple. And then I, somebody, sent me a, somebody sent me an article that said, well, you know, most billionaires do that. They don't want to have to decide what to wear. They just throw on a t-shirt. It's time. And yeah, it's like, I, I already know what I'm wearing every day. I'm wearing a fan base t-shirt, some form of jeans and white shoes, and I'm out the door. And so it's like, all right, I don't have to think about that. I do too, some suit, but it takes yeah. me time to do it. <laughs> right, sometimes you gotta match something yeah, together, yeah, you know, yeah, where you're yeah. going, or the weather, depending <laughs> on the weather or something like that. But it's like, yeah. I'm just t-shirt and jeans. Biggest positive surprise that you've had as a CEO and founder of Fanbase. And listen, you've obviously known the business. You, know, mm -hmm. you even said your dad, ownership, that's important. Mm -hmm. You learned about that. Yeah. So what's the biggest positive surprise? The, the effect that the company has on, on, on current apps. It's a positive thing and a surprise, meaning I've seen when we, when we launched subscription on Fanbase, Fanbase was the first app where you could pull out your phone and click buttons and subscribe to people like you subscribe to Netflix or Spotify. We came up with that technology. Apple wouldn't let us build it at first, right? They said no. Why did they say no? So when you, when you subscribe to something like Netflix, they, on the back end, Apple keeps something that they call a subscription profile on you. They store that. They know that that's what you're subscribed to. Apple said, we're not gonna let you build an app where a person could subscribe to 20 people, so now we have to keep up with 20 profiles, you wind up with 100 million users and we got two billion profiles. Because you only subscribe to Netflix once, you don't subscribe to it one, two, three, four, five, six times. So they said no, and I was like, bro, I just spent $200,000 building this shit, <laughs> right? So I went, to, I went to Ramiro, my CTO, um, who's a brilliant CTO, man, and, 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 and a really good friend, and he goes, no. He goes, listen to what they're saying. He goes, we'll follow their rules, right? We'll bend them, but we won't break them. And, it, and he says, when you run into roadblocks like this, he goes, you're about to do something that no one has ever done before. And that's when I was like, I was nervous, but he's like, we'll follow their rules, but we will, we will build based off their, rec their, their recommendations and their requirements, and we did. So initially, um, the first MVP of Fanbase was, you could subscribe to one person, that's a profile. If you wanted to subscribe to three people, you just had to swap out the one for the three, 
Now you have access to three people, but that's still one profile. And then if you want to subscribe to five people, you swap out the three for the five, and you have access to five people. And that's how we launched the platform, where you could subscribe on your phone and subscribe to someone. And then probably about a year goes by, and we say we hear this inkling that Instagram is building subscriptions. And the first thing we do, we call up Apple. We go, how, are you, how is Instagram able to build what we can't build? And their response, someone inside the company is what, well, we've had a change of part of how we view subscriptions. Mm. I bet. Because when you think about the money that's available for people subscribing to people, it's trillions of dollars. It's not billions, it's trillions of dollars. Think about that there's seven and a half billion people on the planet with a smartphone, but only 222 million people are subscribing to Netflix. So people subscribing to other people are going to be bigger than Netflix or Disney Plus or Hulu ever could be. It's the difference between a good social media app mm -hmm. and a great one. Mm. The difference between a good one and a great one. I think the intention behind the result of what you're building, like what are you trying to create, right? I think a, I think a good social media app has functionality, it has, um, it has, it has tools, but it doesn't have culture. I think, actually, if I were to answer that question differently, I would say a good social media app has functionality and technology. A great social media app has culture and community. Mm. The best social media apps have culture and they have community that are rooted in, the, they, like there is, a, there is a Pinterest community, right? There is a, there is a Patreon community, there is a Facebook community, right? And so building community, that's what makes a great platform. Is, 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 is tech, there's a LinkedIn community, right? That people get the best out of what that platform has to offer. So that's the difference between a good app and a great app is that community and culture are a huge part of it.